Welcome to the J.W. Jupiter Readers Theater, which proudly presents Keith Douglas' poem, The Marvel, followed by a discussion of its standout elements. If you enjoy the reading, like, comment, and subscribe to support the channel, and let me know what you think is interesting about the Marvel or what you'd like to hear me read next. Keith Douglas is the most outstanding poet from World War II, and he published a remarkable portfolio of writing prior to his early death during the invasion of Normandy at the age of 24. There is little doubt that, had he lived, he would have gone on to be one of the great poetic giants of the 20th century, a sentiment shared by both Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath. This poem, however, was written during his training, just before he entered action in the Desert War in North Africa, fighting as a tank officer against Rommel. Focused on the killing of a swordfish as the poem's launching pad, Douglas takes the reader on a descent into wondrous poetic reverie, whirling the reader farther and farther into a mysterious interrelation of violence between the swordfish, the sailors who caught it, and the sea. But... Douglas says it far better, so to not get too far out in front, of the pleasure and presence of the work of art itself. The Marvel by Keith Douglas A baron of the sea, the great tropic swordfish, spread eagled on the thirsty deck where sailors killed him in the bright Pacific Yielded to the sharp, inquiring blade, The eye which guided him and found his prey In the dim country where he was a lord, Which is an instrument forged in semi-darkness, Yet taken from the corpse of this strong traveller, Becomes a powerful enlarging glass, Reflecting the unusual sun's heat. With it a sailor writes on the hot wood the name of a harlot in his last port. For it is one most curious device of many kept by the interesting waves, and I suppose the querulous soft voice of mariners who rotted into ghosts digested by the gluttonous tides could recount many. Let them be your hosts, and take you where their forgotten ships lie, with fishes going over the tall masts. All this emerges from the burning eye. And to engrave that word, the sun goes through with the power of the sea. Writing her name, and a marvel. Two. In the Marvel, Douglas juxtaposes scenes between sailors, a swordfish, and the sea, dangerous, powerful predators and forces, and he locates them between several opposed dualities, which begin to bleed into each other, high and low, ocean and air, darkness and brightness, predator and prey, dead and alive. From their respective positions in these dualities, the predators in preying reach into and inquire, as it were, into a strange unknown dimension of life, death that instrumentally shapes and informs life. Douglas begins with a swordfish already caught by sailors, and does so in classic Keith Douglas manner. What I mean by this is that the poem launches off suddenly, with a certain amount of detached nonchalance towards the violence it describes. It very much foregoes effusive emotional reaction on the part of the speaker, or gruesome detail of the death and dismemberment that could provoke sympathy in the reader. The initial scene is laid down matter-of-fact, and Douglas resists the urge to decorate. Of the swordfish's death it is, 
spread eagled on the thirsty deck where sailors killed him, and Douglas briskly moves us along. But spread eagled is an arresting choice for a fish, and perfectly placed for what else is to come in the poem, for it introduces the poem's series of interlocking dualities. Not only does it communicate the bodily force with which the fish is pinned down, implying the application of several rough, eager hands stretching the fish, a fish being spread-eagled, at least tangentially, invokes that elite raptor of the air in relation to this imposing carnivore of the sea. He accomplishes this striding into the poem with a certain amount of casual confidence and assertion in his language. The poem begins with a blast of metaphor, a baron of the sea, using the muscular language of identity rather than simile to describe the swordfish and he breaks the initial iambic rhythm of the first line into the second with three strong stresses. The great tropic swordfish, which, like a trumpet fanfare, further underscores the aristocratic identity Douglas has already placed with the swordfish. The sailors then use a knife, the sharp inquiring blade of note, to pry out the swordfish's eye. The eye is then used as, transformed into, a powerful enlarging glass. Douglas says the eye is forged in semi-darkness, but now is an instrument of channeling the refracted light of the sun. Douglas has now brought out the poem's polarity between dim dark and light sun explicitly. The sailors then use the eye to not just write, but burn the name of their romantic conquests, another predatory act. The swordfish is a lord and strong traveler, as Douglas says, but in subjecting such a strong predator as the swordfish, so too are the sailors powerful. At this point, it is apparent that the poem's terzo rima structure, crisp three-line stanzas, with a loose A-B-A-C-D-C -C rhyme scheme, is a deliberate choice. It contributes to a feeling of overall momentum as the poet takes us briskly from scene to scene. But the sailors are not impervious to the perils of predation. Douglas reminds us that, unlike the swordfish who is at home in the sea, the sea itself swallows sailors who rot into ghosts digested by the gluttonous tides. It is here that in another turn of characteristic fashion, Douglas suddenly downshifts into a tone of magical reverie distinct from the nonchalant description from before. This occurs at a cesura that breaks the last line of the fifth stanza midway with a hard stop. And I suppose the querulous soft voice of mariners who rotted into ghosts, digested by the gluttonous tides, could recount many. Period. Pause. Let them be your hosts. What follows elevates the poem into a mode of surreal, imaginative, near-mythical contemplation that is sublimely enjoyable and for which I constantly return to the marvel as a favorite. Descending down with the ghosts to their forgotten ships, depth is suddenly transformed into height in dizzying fashion, with fishes going over the tall masts. Douglas takes the reader into complete inversion by finally thrusting us fully into this alien world that was first obliquely experienced with the initial consideration of the swordfish and its eye. We, of course, are tantalized by the mention of the ghost mariner's stories, be they of the myriad unknown ways of the deep sea or of the sailor's last adventure. They tantalize because they must agonizingly remain only in the imagination of a possibility. We cannot ever realize them but sense the wonder 
that there are just such and so many stories we shall never know, locked away in depth and death as unrecoverable sunken treasure. The poem is finally revealed to be not just a mere juxtaposition of scenes, but the initial paths of an adventure of the mind that culminates in this final descent, this catabasis, this journey down into a mysterious underworld, much as Odysseus once journeyed down into Hades. This, though, is a pleasurable and glorious descent into a depth of poetic and imaginative contemplation, first provoked by, and then expanding outwards from, the swordfish's burning eye. And, of course, the pleasurable contemplation of the perspective of this realm and the locked-away stories of the ghosts is only made possible by the story-generating predation of the dangerous sea upon dangerous sailors, the sailors who pried up the swordfish out of its world and into theirs, then killed it, and then stole glimpses through it into that very other world. Death and killing here have a mysterious reciprocity with life that opens up sublime experience and keen probing into its forms and ways. But faster than he guided us to that place, Douglas snaps us out of reverie and back to the swordfish's light-reflecting, burning eye. In the final stanza, the dizzying dichotomies that Douglas like an impresario, has spun out and whirled before us are gathered back together. The name engraved, the sailors, the ghosts deep in the sea who keep their untold stories and experience at the edge of imagination. These are all brought back and unified, labeled as one almost uncontainable mystery of flowing reciprocity. In the last line, the light shining through the eye does physically write a harlot's name, but it simultaneously elicits the whole array of scenes illuminated briefly by the poetic mind. But, perhaps, expanding all of this into clear display is too much, and this mode of seeing and thought cannot be sustained indefinitely without growing dizzy or starstruck or weary or restless. So Douglas packs it all back up, simply calls it a marvel, and ending the poem with a word perfectly placed, the casual yet anticipatory too, he moves on to see again something more in something else elsewhere. Thank you for visiting the J.W. Jupiter Readers Theatre. Let me know what your thoughts on the Marvel are in the comments below. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you heard. And I'll see you soon on another J.W. Jupiter reading adventure.